I gotcha. GJ needs Kim for some top secret save the world action. Actually, GJ needs you, huh? Ron Stoppable. <gasps> for what? Hey, hello, how do you do? Shady Directs here. A thought occurred to me the other day. You know that thing I do where I review an episode of King of the Hill and everyone gives me views? What if I did that before a different show? So today I'm talking about Kim Possible, a classic cartoon from the distant decade of the 2000s, where everyone was goth instead of LGBT, and we were all scared of terrorism instead of diseases. Hey, the players change, but the game stays the same. Long ago, I told myself that if I ever reviewed Kim Possible, there was one episode I absolutely had to do first, The Ron Factor. Amp down, ain't no secret. The Ron Factor is me. But before we get into it, this is a new show to the channel, which means some of you intellectuals have no idea what Kim Possible is, nor why you should care, because your childhood apparently sucked. Kim Possible is a Disney Channel original show that ran for four seasons and two TV movies throughout the 2000s. The title character, Kim Possible, is a teenage girl who uses her cheerleading skills to save the world along with her best friend, Ron Stoppable. It amazes me that because I grew up hearing these names all the time, they feel completely normal to say. Kim Possible, Ron Stoppable. They should sound stupid, but they don't. Also on Kim's team is a super genius boy named Wade who gives Kim all her gadgets and a naked mole rat named Rufus who is Ron's pet. The show combined your typical 90s slash 2000s plot of teenagers living their teenage lives with a parody plot of spy movies like 007 and Mission Impossible, while also throwing in other action genre cliches like superheroes, kung fu movies, etc. In the show there's this organization called Global Justice led by Dr. Director. Okay no, that name is stupid, Nostalgia's not gonna save it this time. Dr. Director is basically Nick Fury and Global Justice this is basically S.H.I.E.L.D. There's a lot more lore that comes with the show, but for this episode, that's really all you need to know. The episode starts with some random ninjas stealing an expensive looking shiny ball when Kim and Ron show up on the scene, a very typical moment for the show. Kim does the Kim thing and chases down the ninja looking really cool and competent while doing so. Ron does the Ron thing, trying his best to help, but not being nearly as competent as Kim. Eventually Ron catches up, but trips over himself, forcing Kim to adapt, which allows her to catch the bad guy. Hi, I'm Kim. And you are a ninja bot? Doctor Director? Really, lady, you need to get a name change. Take it from me, Shady Durags. Now that's a cool name. Welcome back to Global Justice. Oh man. This was all a test? Ron and Kim think that Global Justice once again need Kim's help for a mission, but Dr. Director reveals that the person they actually need is Ron. And then the theme song plays. I'm your basic average girl, and I'm here to save the world. You can't stop me cause I'm Kim Possible. The visuals were scenes from the show mixed in with a super spy title screen. It was fun and memorable, but nothing special. The actual music on the other hand? Call me big man, you wanna reach me when you wanna page me? It's okay. Back in my day, we would give something with this amount of entertainment quality the label tight. It could also be described as off the chain, but you'd be falling pretty behind the times if you were still using that vernacular. So what's the sitch? Call me, beep me if you wanna reach me. I could go into more detail why this song is amazing, but there's the whole lazy thing I got going on. Thankfully, Tariq analyzed the Ed and Nettie opening, and I like that video, so that means he's obligated to make more like it, and he should start with Kim Possible. Tariq, get on it. Hmm, Ed and Nettie. It gives me an idea. After the opening, Femme Double D explains her sudden interest in Ron. GJ has been spying on Kim to try and figure out why she's so successful in all her endeavors. My mom's a brain surgeon and my dad's a rocket scientist. I guess my genetics rock. <laughs> Gotta give props to the animation department, that is an adorable face. One interesting thing about this show that fascinates me is that it had reoccurring explanations. For example, people would ask why Kim is good at everything and she would constantly blame genetics because her mom is a brain surgeon and her dad is a rocket scientist. And actually, we do learn in other episodes that it's not just her parents, her grandmother was also a secret agent when she was young. Now you might expect the audience to get angry that Kim, as a character, has an easier life simply thinking to her genes, but no. People accepted that explanation and were even happy about it. It's just part of the lore. Femme Double D, however, says that Global Justice suspects there's a different reason Kim succeeds at saving the world specifically, and that reason is Ron. GJ thinks Ron is the key to my success? We call the intangibles you bring to Kim's endeavors the Ron Factor. Right on. 
This might seem ludicrous, but look back at the test. Ron was the reason Kim caught that ninja. Because Ron fell, Kim had to dive after him and use her grappling hook. This action gave her the speed and leverage she needed to ultimately catch up to the ninja. Now, maybe Kim could have caught the ninja without Ron's interference, but the point stands. In this instance, the Ron factor is what swayed things in her favor. Kim is having a hard time accepting what's being told to her, but Femme Double D assures her it's true and that GJ will be examining Ron further so they themselves can match Kim's success rate. They could study me too might help. No thanks. Very important moment, we will be coming back to it. Little does anyone in the room know, however, an enemy presence is watching their every move. We transition over to the bad guys layer. You can tell they're the bad guys because Stem Double D wears blue and they're all wearing red. Global justice? <laughs> Agent Beta, show some judgment around the dog. <laughs> Pretty little puppy. Ahem. <clears throat> Hello? Dude! Oh, uh... <clears throat> hey, Shady, what's another reason this show is amazing? I'm glad you asked that unprompted, very real fan of mine. One of the things that absolutely sold this show was the villains. Don't get me wrong, Kim and Ron are great, and I'll get into them more later in the video, but without the villains, this show's comedy would drop by a good 60-70%. to 70 Take our villain for this particular episode, Gemini. He's an evil version of Femme Double D. No, really, that's how he describes himself. I am her dark reflection, her evil opposite in every way. And he takes his role as an evil leader of a massive organization to every cliche he can think of. You have failed me for the last time. But I just started on Tuesday. Silence! <laughs> we transition over to Bueno Nacho, Cameron's usual hangout spot. Ah, uh, I'm having a Nako flashback. KP, my Nako idea was a grand slam. And your head got so big you could have worn that. And here's the thing I enjoyed most about this show, Kim and Ron's chemistry. While the villains might steal the show when they're on screen, ultimately this is a show about Kim Possible and Ron Stoppable. These two need to remain interesting no matter what situation they're in, and this show pretty much perfected that. Not only do Kim and Ron have personalities that are enjoyable to watch regardless of their circumstances, but they are one of the greatest foils I've ever seen. I like seeing Kim and I like seeing Ron, but I absolutely love seeing Kim and Ron. They also have an extremely wholesome best friend vibe. Like you'd think Ron wouldn't be anywhere near Kim's radar since she's the most popular girl in school and is the head of the cheer squad, but the opposite is true. There are episodes where Kim struggles to go a week without hanging out with Ron. Shoot, the knock fiasco Kim's referring to only happened due to her roping Ron into getting a job with her because she thought it'd be more fun if they both worked there. The episode goes on, but there isn't much plot progression. Ron continues to gloat, Kim continues to think Ron is getting a big head, GJ continues to examine Ron, and Gemini continues to spy on Ron while getting rid of his own henchmen. Kim Possible was a joke focused show, so it was very common for episodes to drag out their plot and just focus on gags. I don't mean that in a bad way though. The jokes in the show were great and still kept you entertained. It just means that someone like me who's reviewing an episode has to skip a good chunk of it. There's only so many times I can say, they told a joke and it was funny, without it getting repetitive. Eventually, Femme Double D figures out that Gemini is also interested in the Ron factor and decides to be more hands on. Meanwhile, Gemini, losing faith and his henchman also decides to step on the scene. I'll take him to go. Hey! Why the crap did y'all just let him walk into the restaurant? Like he got all the way up to the counter and nobody did anything. Gemini defeats all the global justice guards and kidnaps Ron. Kim, seeing her best friend get kidnapped and being Kim Possible, tries to pursue him but falls short. On their way to Wii headquarters, no doubt. Wii? The worldwide evil empire, also known as Wii. I so badly want to make a Nintendo joke, but this episode came out in 2003 when it was way too early, and this review is in 2022 when it's way too late. Gemini introduces himself to Ron and tries to persuade him to join the evil team. Join me or be obliterated. That is your choice. That's not a choice, that's an ultimatum. Meanwhile, Global Justice does everything they can to try and track down Gemini. Like always, the professionals who do this for a living can't make any progress, but someone on Kim's team can. Anything? I'm getting something, it's faint. Got it, the North Atlantic. Kim and Femme Double D head to Wade's coordinates and reach Ron just as he's about to give in. Choose evil, Ron Stoppable, 
and you can have all the Chimoritos you like. You put that in writing, of course. I love how consistent Ron's character is. It's amazing how motivated he is by Bueno Nacho food. So we get the standard Kim Possible ending. Lots of explosions, lots of puns. Let me give you a hand. How many times have you used that line? And it's still fresh. And of course, the villain being more hilarious than he has any right to be. Why do you want the Ron factor so badly? Because it's none of your beeswax. You want it because I have it. You always wanted my stuff. We'll settle this like grown-ups. The encounter ends by Rufus getting the jump on Gemini, which allows Ron to trick him and be victorious. The Ron factor. Amazing. Correction, Dr. D. The Kim factor. With just a little splash of Ron. Well, that was a quick turnaround, like lightning quick. There was literally no reason for Ron to change his mind other than the episode needed to end on the status quo. He was the one who ultimately took down Gemini. He should still think the Ron factor works. Global Justice cancels the Ron factor, but thinks that maybe they had the right idea, just the wrong person. We call it the Rufus factor. And that was the Ron Factor. So why review this episode? It's not the best written or the most memorable. Shoot, it doesn't even have one of the main returning villains. This is Gemini's only episode. Well, like I said earlier, my favorite thing about the show is the dynamic between Kim and Ron. And you remember those running explanations I was talking about? This episode was the first mention of the show's most important one. Kim and Ron need each other. Global Justice was pretty close to being right. The reason Kim's success rate is so high is indeed because of Ron, but they made one crucial mistake. They could study me too. Might help. No thanks. They completely ignored how the Ron factor works with Kim specifically. Kim and Ron working together is what makes the team succeed, because Kim is the competent one who can do anything, while Ron is the unpredictable one who will try anything. The villains can predict Kim and they can stop Ron, but they can't stop Kim nor can they predict Ron. Kim Possible did so many years ago really well what Miraculous fails to do today. It made the goofy blonde sidekick male character matter. This episode is also very fond of me because I see it as a metaphor for foiling characters in general, specifically comedic duos. In comedy, there's the typical funny man straight man gag, where one character, the funny man, does something ridiculous, and another character, who is more down to earth, the straight man, reacts to the first character's actions. When you're naive about comedy, you're tempted to get all the props to the funny man, but like in all foils, the straight man is vital because it's their reaction that makes the joke even more hilarious. Ron is similar to the funny man. Everyone pays attention to him and gives him the credit for the success, but they don't realize that the straight man, Kim, matters just as much. When it comes to two characters foiling, the secret is synergy. Your best foils aren't to blame on one character nor the other, but on both characters working together. This has been Shady Durags. So long. Farewell. I've been Goodbye.